I'm going to take a moment for a teachable moment here. I discussed this with Anna before the early service. Years ago, I used this similar call to worship in another bulletin, and someone uh, told me afterward we had a typo in the bulletin. And I said, where's the typo? They said, you misspelled heart. Well, the heart there is, it says, as a heart longs for flowing streams, a heart is a type of deer. Uh, so that all of a sudden the, the Bible verse makes sense. It's, it's a picture of a deer moving through the forest thirsty and doing what? Looking for a stream of water. Glad to find it. And it's, uh, it's not heart as in your heart. It's a, and, I, and what Anna said is I could have just put deer in there. And, <laughs> um, but this is how the verse reads in the Revised Standard Version. So uh, lest you think there's a typographical error, so what you picture here is a, is a, is a thirsty animal moving through the forest, looking for, and, and it's, it reminds us that as we move through this thirsty world, we yearn for God. So let's call each other to worship. As a heart longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, O God, and for the living water of your promise. My hope rests in you, O God, for you are my strong deliverer. And so I will sing praises to your name forever.
In our brokenness, we will find no healing apart from the peace of God. In our emptiness, we will find no hope apart from the grace of God. So let us speak those words of confession which are so hard to say, so that we may hear the whispers of God's mercy. Let us pray. Forgive us, O God, when we resist the transforming power of Jesus Christ. He has come to make things new, to topple long-standing idols, and to fix what is broken in our world. But there is so much about the world that suits us. There is much about the world that works to our advantage. And so when Jesus begins to turn things upside down, we want to keep our settledness intact. So make us more open to what Jesus is doing in the world, O oh God. More than that, stir us to share in that work, that our main ambition will be to seek your kingdom, to the glory of your name. accuse us saves us from sin and death. The one who could condemn us cradles us in grace. The one who could punish us prays for us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. So hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus in whom we find life.
Phew. <laughs> Thanks be to God. I want to share some of the joys and concerns of our church family as we go now to God in a time of prayer. One, we lead off with a joy, and that is that Dan and Amanda Meyer welcome their second daughter, uh, Claire Louise Meyer, um, uh, at the end of last week. And so we are rejoicing with them. Uh, baby Claire made her grand entrance into the world about 26 minutes after they got to the hospital. Um, and so uh, everybody is safe and happy, and that'll be a story they will tell for years to come. Uh, big sister Tess is relishing her new role, and they are settling in well at home as a family of four. Uh, this past Friday, we had a service in witness to the resurrection um, and in thanksgiving for the life of Martha Moore Jerome, who died just about a week and a half ago. Um, she was a gift to this church. She was here for many, many years um, and served as the pastor's assistant for visitation during some of her time as a member here. Um, a delightful person. It was easy to celebrate her life and to thank God for it. Um, but please be in prayer for her son, Kurt, uh, and their whole family. We also learned that yesterday morning, Melba Sparrow, who was a longtime member here, uh, passed away. And so uh, we are praying for her family. Uh, we don't have details yet about a service uh, for her, but we will be sure to get those out to you as we know them. Jackie Mercer, the husband of Fran Mercer, remains in critical condition. He's still at the hospital, um, but he has made some progress in the last couple of days. Uh, of course, we want to continue to pray for Jackie and for Fran. Dean and Anne DeMacy were both in the hospital this week for pneumonia, to treat pneumonia. Dean went home. He was actually at church uh, at the 8.30 service. Um, Anne uh, is still recovering, and so please be in prayer for both Dean and Anne DeMacy. David Wirth broke his leg last Sunday on his way from church uh, to lunch, I believe. He was in the hospital uh, to treat that injury, and he is now in a rehab facility, so we offer prayers on his behalf. Bob Barham had a successful um, surgery midweek. He is at home recuperating, and thanks you all for your continued prayers as he heals. And I learned between services that Betsy Reams' sister, um, her name is Katie Harrelson, she's in Fayetteville, um, uh, she is in the hospital following a heart attack that she had um, this past week. They have a two-year-old and a one-week-old baby, so this was right after delivering that second baby. Um, she is in the hospital and they have asked for prayers uh, for her, so please pray for Katie Harrelson, who is the sister of Betsy Reams. Let us turn our hearts now to God in a time of prayer. Creator God, Lord of all life and giver of every good gift, we praise you for the freshness of a new Sabbath day in which to worship you. We thank you for the gift of music and for those who offer it in our midst. We thank you for your word and for those who live and speak in such ways as to reveal your good purposes for each of us. And we thank you for the spirit who moves in and through us, summoning us again to your truths, the spirit who tugs at our hearts and summons us to heed your call to love sacrificially and to serve compassionately. We offer up to you our prayers for all fathers today and everyone who has been like a loving father to each of us. And we ask your blessing be upon those who nurture and provide for children, for those fathers and grandfathers, uncles and brothers and friends, who have been positive role models and who have tended to each of us with constancy and patience. Be with those who have strained relationships with their fathers, that those relationships might know your deep healing. Be also with those who do not know their fathers and those for whom such a holiday reminds them of how acutely they miss their own fathers. And be especially with all parents who have lost a beloved child to grant peace and comfort to them in their grief. For we do offer these prayers in the midst of much grief in our world, O oh God. We are still reeling after a week of violence around the world and in our own country. God of life, we lament the massacre in Orlando just one year after Charleston. We lament the killing of innocent people and the cutting short of lives of promise and creativity. And we cry out to you for their families, their spouses, their colleagues, and their friends, all who are deep in mourning over them this day, O oh God. And we long for a day when neighbor will not seek to terrorize neighbor. We long for a day when profound hatred itself will finally be put to death, O oh God, as it was on the cross. 
And in its place, O God, let there be resurrection. The triumph of life over death, the triumph of hope over despair. But for today, O God, we pray along with the prophets for the day, that day when swords will be beaten into plowshares and when we will study war no more. We long for the day when tragedies will be met not with platitude and sentiment and resignation, but with prayer and compassion and action, O God. Give us grace and courage for the living of these days. And lead us, O Lord, as we seek to live faithfully bearing your name, as we seek to care for the sick and we visit the lonely and we reach out to those who might need a loving word or embrace, remembering those the world so often forgets. Set before us the life of Jesus as a reminder of how a human life might be fully lived. And make us your glad and joyful servants as we go about honoring him in all we do and we say. For it is in Jesus' name we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to invite all the children here with us to come and join me down front for a moment together. Come on down. We got lots of room. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Hi, friends. How are you today? Good? You good? To ask you a question. And this is, a, excuse me, friend, you okay? This is a tough question. Have you ever felt like you were on the outside of something? Have you ever felt like an outsider? Like people didn't help you feel like you belonged in a group? Have you ever felt that way? I sure have felt that way before. Where I just had those moments where you felt like you were right outside and the group wasn't quite ready to let you be a part of them yet. It's not a good feeling, is it? In our Bible story today that comes from the book of Luke, there's a man that Jesus goes and spends some time with that has been an outsider to his town. They haven't let him come in because they decided there was something wrong with him. So they decided he wasn't allowed to be a part of their town and a part of their group. And do you know what Jesus said to that? You know what Jesus said about that? He went to that very man and he looked at him and he basically said, you're a child of God. And Jesus fixed the situation, which is what Jesus does for us pretty regularly. And what I want to talk about for just a minute today is what I've been thinking a lot about as a grown-up on a regular basis. And that is, how do we as kids and as grown-ups stop thinking about other people being on the outside and allowing all of us to love one another the way Jesus showed us how to love one another. And what I have decided is that I want you to look, my, look me in the eyes, let me see your beautiful eyes, because I want you to hear me say what I am gonna say to you. Are you ready? Are you ready? You are a blessed child of God. You are a blessed child of God. You are a blessed child of God. I think that's it. 
There's no outside, there's no inside. Doesn't matter who you like, doesn't matter who your friends are, doesn't matter what you look like. You are a blessed child of God. Now here's the challenge for today, are you ready? I want everyone out there, grown-ups, kids, all of us, we are gonna pick a person to look at, we are gonna look them in the eyeballs, and we are going to say to one another, you are a blessed child of God. Because maybe, just maybe, if we can practice doing that with everyone else we meet, at some point, we'll start to love each other and stop having outside and inside groups. And we will just see each other as blessed children of God because I think that's what we're supposed to do. So are you ready? Are you ready? I need you to find a person somewhere around you. I need you to look them in the eyes. And on the count of three, we are going to say, what are we going to say, Owen? You are a blessed child of God. All right, here we go. One, two, three. You are a blessed child of God. Please remember it. Say it often. Think it in your head. Everyone you meet. We're not looking for insiders and outsiders. We are looking for children of God, and they are everywhere we look. Will you pray with me? Will you pray with me? I'll say it, then you say it. God of love, thank you for making us all your blessed children. Help us see that in one another and spread your love a little farther. Amen. Blessed children of God, thank you for coming and being with me. You can go back to your Let us pray. Dear God, we need your light today. This week we have seen our sisters and brothers gunned down while dancing and making a joyful noise. We have felt this tragedy while still mourning for our friends in Charleston, killed in the midst of worshiping you. 
We need your presence with us, God, not just to comfort us and those even more closely affected by these tragedies, but for the will to act for peace and reconciliation and to refuse to sit by and witness another tragedy and another and another. We need your light today, God. We need your voice. We pray that you will speak to us through these words written so long ago. May we find solace, may we find strength in this psalm of faith in the midst of despair. And if we are so fortunate to see your light here today, God, in these words and in the people around us, we pray that we may take that light with us out of this place and share it with a world so in need of illumination. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading comes from Psalm 43. Let us listen for the word of God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the harp, O oh God. My God, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keeping John busy today. We turn now to the New Testament, to Luke's record of the gospel, to the eighth chapter. Uh, we've been drawing from these chapters in Luke for the last few weeks. Jesus is moving around uh, in what we call the Holy Land. Um, today, he's uh, tr the story we get today, he's moved to a, a different side of the Sea of Galilee to the region of the Gerasenes. But we pick it up at the 26th verse, Jesus and his disciples. So listen again to God's word for us. <clears throat> then they, Jesus and his followers, arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes. He did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. 
So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Be at work here among us, O God. Be present according to your spirit that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I wonder if the name Bert Lance rings a bell with you. If it does, you'd be showing your age. Some of you may remember that Bert Lance was the director of the Office of Management and Budget during Jimmy Carter's first year in the White House. You may also remember that he resigned that position during President Carter's first year the result of an alleged banking scandal for which he was later acquitted. With that resignation though, President Carter lost not only a trusted advisor, but also his daily prayer partner. As Mr. Lance and President Carter prayed together every morning, at least every morning where they could be in the same room. But you may not know that Mr. Lance is given credit for coining a phrase which has become embedded in this nation's vernacular. A phrase that most of us have probably used at one time or another. For when someone asked Mr. Lance about some matter in the business world, he said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. A phrase that was then quoted by several business journals by writers like William Sapphire, and before long, everybody was saying it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Which sounds like pretty good advice. It guards against meddling where no meddling is needed. It embraces the philosophy that sometimes it's best to leave well enough alone. But of course, somebody then has to decide when well enough is well enough. And sometimes there is no consensus, no universal agreement about when something is broken or not, or needs fixing or not. The status quo almost always favors some and disenfranchises others. It's just the way the world works. In every economic system, for example, there are always the haves and there are the have-nots. Some systems are better than others, but in every system, some experience prosperity and comfort, while others experience poverty and hardship. And if things are working out pretty well for you, you are inclined to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and let's leave well enough alone. But when viewed from the underside, what doesn't seem broken to those above seems completely broken from a different angle. And leaving well enough alone is fine if things are well enough for you. But if things are not at all well for you and your family, you might wish that someone would come along and shake things up. Which brings us to our story today, the story of Jesus strolling into a city and not leaving well enough alone. Now, let me be the first to say that this is one crazy sounding story. Jesus comes into the region of, of the Gerasenes and bumps into a man who is in torment. He is possessed by demons. He lives out at the cemetery. He's wearing not a stitch of clothing. He's been ostracized by his community. But Jesus casts out the demon or demons because there were legion. 
So Jesus casts out these demons who then went and entered into a group of pigs who were apparently driven mad enough that they went down a steep hillside into a lake and drowned. Which you'd think would be a good thing unless they were your pigs. And unless the economy of the town was dependent on pig farming. And so this whole town is now in an uproar and they come looking for Jesus. And when they find him, they find him sitting there with this guy who used to be demon possessed, naked and living in a graveyard. But now he's sitting up, fully clothed. And according to Luke, he's in his right mind. So his life, the life of this real human being has been transformed for the better. But the people ask Jesus to leave because his presence was just too disruptive in their little town. Why couldn't he just leave well enough alone? Well, it turns out Jesus just can't do that. He can't leave well enough alone. Jesus tends to meddle. When he sees lepers being treated as subhumans, he treats them as if they matter to him, as if they matter to God. And he restores them to civilized community, which means that civilized community is going to have to adjust. Civilized community was happy with them as lepers out there wherever the lepers live. But Jesus wouldn't leave well enough alone because those lepers, as God's children, deserved better. And in the story we read today, everybody in the region of the Gerasenes probably knew about that poor, tragic, demon-possessed guy out there living a life of isolation in the cemetery but it was probably easier for them to ignore him as long as everything in their little pig farming village was okay. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But for Jesus, having a child of God living as an outcast means that something is broken. So he fixed it. And if this town values pigs more than people, which apparently they do. Well, it's time for a recalculation of what matters most. This is what Jesus does. He meddles. He comes into communities where people are made to live on the margins, where people are vulnerable, where people are treated as if they don't matter. And even though whole communities seem to be okay with this sort of arrangement, Jesus is not. And so he starts meddling. He starts turning over the tables of the status quo because leaving well enough alone is not his idea of the kingdom. It's not how the world is supposed to work. And the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be the community that continues to meddle in his name and on the behalf of the forgotten, the ignored, the rejected, the reviled, and the invisible. Even though it would be easier to leave well enough alone because for most of us, let's be honest, well enough is pretty good. If you like history, and I know a lot of you do, you might like Mary Beard's new book on the history of ancient Rome. One, in the words of one reviewer, it tells how a little town by the Tiber River grew into a global superpower. And here in an election year, we rightly give credit to Rome for introducing some revolutionary ideas into the public square. Things like shared power, limited terms of office for government officials, and the right of people to elect their own leaders. Those are Roman ideas, groundbreaking ideas. But as will not surprise you, the privilege of holding office and voting for office holders in that day was limited to men and in particular, men of means, 
Women, slaves, the poor had few, if any, rights. And this notion of the way the world was organized was challenged by early Christians who had taken the Apostle Paul seriously when he said, you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, no male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And people who took that seriously, that all people matter because they matter to God, began to challenge the assumptions of the Roman Empire. This is why early Roman historians referred to the early church, and I love this badge, they called them those troublesome Christians. We should all be so named. Named that because instead of going along to get along, which is what most people do, as long as things are working out okay, these early Christians saw that there was an inherent unfairness, an inherent injustice in the way that some people were being treated. And they weren't going to shut up about it. And while the Roman Empire liked to talk about itself as being the kingdom of God, the early Christian church said, nope, we are because we are a kingdom of love and of fairness and of dignity, not just for some, not just for a few, but for all. To put this in very simple terms, this is why the church of Jesus Christ tends to take the side of the underdog with the victims of tyranny and oppression and those who live their lives under threat. It's why the church concerns itself with the homeless and those who are refugees. It's why the church concerns itself with those who are fighting an uphill battle for civil rights. It's why the church concerns itself with any marginalized group that is made to feel that they are of no concern. It's why the church concerns itself with any person or persons who face discrimination or abuse or the threat of demonization or hate crime. We do this because Jesus would. We do it because Jesus did, not because it's easy or popular or comfortable, but because Jesus did. It's really a very easy calculation. The church only has to be concerned about the people that Jesus would be concerned about. If someone is beyond the embrace of Jesus, we don't have to worry about them makes it easy. Here's the problem with that theory. I've read all four Gospels more than once. And here's what I've discovered. Jesus has a pretty remarkable reach and a very wide embrace. And he always seemed to be on the lookout for those who lived on the edges, who lived on the edges not because they wanted to live on the edges, but because they had been pushed to the edges by polite society, which is not always polite. One of the real benefits of sending young people and not so young people on mission trips is they sometimes come back to us with a new way of looking at the world. Perhaps with a new appreciation of how richly blessed they are, but also a new awareness that not everybody is. And having spent a week or more learning that they can make a difference in the world, they are no longer satisfied with leaving well enough alone. Not when real people are suffering. Not when real people are treated as outcasts. Not when real people are made to feel that they matter less than the rest of us. People who have begun to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus begin to see things that the rest of us sometimes fail to see. 
they notice things that some of us have trained ourselves not to notice. And while most of us are busy leaving well enough alone, those who have begun to see the world through the eyes of Jesus busy themselves with trying to make this world look more like the kingdom of God. Sharing in the work of Jesus, which will not be accomplished until all is well, until all is really, really well. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us bring our gifts to God. Gracious God, we lay these, our gifts, before you as a humble offering and a small response to the great gift of love that you have extended to us in Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the ways that you have been at work in each of us and that you call us out into the world as your beloved children, called to love and serve every soul we meet with unselfishness and joy. 
Take these gifts, O God, and as you use them to your glory, so use us. For service and obedience to you are our highest calling and our deepest contentment. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalm that was read as a part of our worship today is a psalm of lament. It ends with praise, but it's a psalm of lament. There are more lament psalms in the psalm than any other type. When life is working out for you, you don't need to sing songs of lament, but that doesn't mean that no one is. The calling of the people of God is to be attentive to who is singing psalms of lament, who is feeling some distance from God. Who needs to experience the embrace of God? So when we're not singing psalms of lament, you can bet some folks are. Our calling is to stand with them so that they don't sing or stand alone. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, May that God be with you and abide with you, with those you love, and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.